In October 1991, a West Sail 32 named Satori got caught in the perfect storm 75 miles south of Nantucket. Monster seas that sank commercial fishing vessels knocked her flat twice, holding her on her beam for 30 seconds each time. The crew got rescued, the boat washed ashore at Assateague, Maryland, and when the owner retrieved her, he found zero structural damage. He paid $10,000 in salvage and sailed her another 6,000 miles. That's not luck, that's engineering. If you're shopping for a blue water cruiser or wondering what separates a boat that crosses oceans from one that barely survives a storm at the dock, you need to understand something most brokers won't mention. The toughest sailboats ever built weren't designed to be comfortable or fast, they were designed to bring you home when everything goes wrong. True offshore toughness starts with hand-laid solid fiberglass, alternating layers of matte and woven roving achieving glass to resin ratios around 70 to 30. Builders in the 1960s and 1970s deliberately overbuilt their boats because nobody knew minimum required thicknesses yet, producing hulls far heavier than necessary but virtually indestructible. The other critical features are full keels, integral to the hull structure, encapsulated ballast eliminating corrosion-prone keel bolts, and skeg-hung rudders protected from debris and whale strikes. Only seven production sailboats truly earned the built-like-a-tank reputation, and here they are. The most painstakingly built small blue water boat ever produced came from Sam L. Morse Company in Costa Mesa, California, where craftsmen assembled each Bristol Channel Cutter 28 like fine furniture with entirely hand-fabricated interiors and no production liners whatsoever. Designer Lyle Hess drew inspiration from 19th century pilot boats that carried lots of canvas, lugged heavy cargo, and sailed fast on all points. What really established this boat's reputation was the couple who inspired it, Lynn and Larry Party. Their first Lyle Hess design, the 24-foot 7-inch Seraphin, covered 47,000 miles through 47 countries over 11 years without an engine. Talison followed at 29 feet 9 inches, logging 80,000 miles including a Cape Horn passage from west to east against prevailing winds. The Pardes distilled their philosophy into seven words, go small, go simple, but go now. Between 1975 and 2008, Sam L. Morse produced somewhere between 126 and 174 hulls, and Cape George Marine Works in Port Townsend, Washington, holds the molds for limited production. Blue Water Boats magazine called it a pinnacle of ruggedness and practicality, noting that few boats absorbed the punishment of extended voyaging as well as the Bristol Channel Cutter. Finding one today means paying somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000, sometimes more. The man behind Amel emerged from World War II service with the French Resistance, missing one eye, nearly blind in the other, and crippled in one leg. Henry Amel possessed what people who knew him described as Iron Will, and he changed his surname from Tonset to Amel, because the person he once was did not exist anymore. Known as Le Captain, Henri completed several transatlantic crossings despite his visual handicap before dying in 2005, four days shy of 92. The company he built doesn't produce cruising vessels, it produces what the manufacturer calls integrated cruising systems. The Super Maramu features four full-height watertight bulkheads, two equipped with watertight interior doors, and the hull bonds to the deck while still in the mold to form a monocoque structure. A proprietary blister barrier coating sits under the gel coat, and here's the result. Zero osmotic blisters have ever been reported on any Super Maramu. Every piece of hardware mounts with stainless fasteners into stainless plates buried in the laminate, and push-button electric furlers handle every sale operation. The design brief captured the target customer perfectly, a retired couple wanting to sail around the world. Standard equipment includes generator, dishwasher, and washer-dryer, all systems identical across production so owners can find parts anywhere on the planet. 497 Super Maramu hulls left the factory between 1988 and 2007. When Henri departed in 1980, he transferred his shares to employees, making the company 100% employee-owned. Amel continues building in La Rochelle, France, 
having produced more 50-foot-plus cruising boats than any other manufacturer. Used examples trade between 150,000 and 260,000 euros. Bill Creolock described the Pacific Seacraft 37 as the only chance he ever had to design a boat that didn't have to please anyone else but him, and the result became his masterpiece. The American Sailboat Hall of Fame inducted it in 1992, and Practical Sailor praised it as a superb cruising boat with few piers and construction quality that sails well on all points. Hand-laid solid fiberglass forms the hull, with post-1988 boats adding vinyl ester resin outer layers protecting against osmotic blisters. Post-1993 production, upgraded to biaxial roving meeting American Bureau of Shipping Standards. Displacement runs 16,000 to 16,200 pounds, producing a heavy displacement-to-length ratio in the mid-330s, and the angle of vanishing stability reaches 140 degrees. Creolock's design priority was reducing crew fatigue, which he identified as a major enemy of seaworthiness. Owners consistently report the boat almost never pounds in a seaway while still delivering six-knot passages and surfing above ten knots on big waves. Two owners caught in severe conditions described hitting 12 knots while surfing, with steering so easy one wished for a tiller instead of a wheel. Production launched in 1978 under cruising consultants as the Creolock 37, with 16 boats completed before Pacific Seacraft took over in 1980. Approximately 200 hulls followed through 2007 and Stephen Brody relocated the company to North Carolina in 2012, where production continues today. New base price sits at $336,000, while used vinyl ester era boats from 1988 onward command $75,000 to $230,000. Harry Halberg started building wooden boats at 14 and founded his yard in Kungsvik in Sweden in 1943. 20 years later, he pioneered European fiberglass construction, producing the first GRP hulls with wooden superstructures in series. Christoph Rossi arrived from Bavaria in 1960, carrying nothing but a bicycle, founded his own yard in 1965, then purchased Halberg's operation upon Harry's 1972 retirement, and merged the two names into one legendary brand. Over 9,400 yachts have left the yard under Lloyd's certificate supervision. Hull construction combines fiberglass sandwich with 25mm polyvinyl cellular plastic core for strength and insulation, supported by built-in longitudinal stringers and molded-in ballast keels completely encased in fiberglass. That signature blue stripe first appeared on the HR38 in 1976-77 and remains the brand's global calling card. Swedish sailor Kurt Björklund proved what these boats can handle by completing three-and-a-half solo circumnavigations aboard his 1974 Hallberg Rossi 31 Monsoon Golden Lady. His first circumnavigation began in 1983, his second rounded Cape Horn, and no special strengthening was ever performed on the hull. That boat now sits in a museum in Rouen, Sweden, as the first fiberglass vessel in the country to earn such recognition. Magnus Rossi maintains family ownership today, with production continuing from Ellos, Sweden. Argentine designer German Freres has drawn all models since 1989, improving performance through longer waterlines and semi-balanced rudders. The HR48 demonstrates premium blue water specifications with 40,786 pounds displacement, over 17,000 pounds of lead ballast at 42% ratio, all certified by Lloyd surveyors for hull, deck, bulkheads, chain plates, and rudder. August 1979 brought the Fastnet race disaster, killing 15 competitors while capsizing 75 boats and sinking five. Force, 10-plus winds drove waves to 50 feet, and one small boat emerged from the chaos as a legend. 23-year-old Alan Kerr skippered ascent to a finish as the only boat in Class 5, the smallest class, to complete the race. She absorbed multiple knockdowns and conditions destroying boats all around her, and the post-race inquiry established the Contessa 32's stability curve as the benchmark for seaworthy design. Her angle of vanishing stability measures 156 degrees, meaning she self-writes even when knocked past horizontal. 
That same hull went on to sail over 100,000 miles under Willie Kerr's ownership, ranging from Arctic to Antarctic waters, Hawaii to Easter Island, much of it single-handed. Kerr continued sailing ascent until age 85, and 40 years after the disaster, in 2019, that same boat competed in the Fastnet race, again under ownership of the Rogers family, who were the original builders. Doug Peterson designed a hull combining racing performance with offshore capability, displacing 9,500 pounds with an exceptional 53% ballast ratio that makes her stiff for her size. John Kretschmer documented sailing the Contessa 32 Gigi from New York around Cape Horn against prevailing winds to San Francisco in his book Cape Horn to Starboard. 15-year-old Seb Clover became the youngest person to sail the Atlantic solo in 2003 aboard Contessa 32. Reflection Jeremy Rogers Lenatide in England launched production in 1966 and built over 750 hulls, with production continuing today. The British Joint Services Sail Training Center operated nine Contessas for decades, sending them to Greenland, Norway, and multiple Fastnet races. After 1979, the sailing press stopped calling her a coastal racer and started calling her an ocean pugilist. Bob Perry drew the Valiant 40 in 1973 at 27 years old, creating what became known as the first performance cruiser by combining racing-style underwater lines with serious offshore capability. Critics dismissed it as too light for serious offshore work, and Perry's response was simple. Someone should have told Mark Schrader before he sailed his solo non-stop circumnavigation. Schrader covered 27,188 miles in 199 days in 1983, the fastest at that time, and that was just the beginning of this design's record. Bill and Mary Black completed the first Valiant 40 circumnavigation between 1975 and 1979 aboard hull number 107, Foreign Affair, earning the Cruising Club of America Blue Water Medal. Francis Stokes sailed hull number 122, Moonshine to Victory as first American monohull in the 1976 O-Star, then placed second overall in the inaugural 1982-83 BOC race after stopping mid-race to rescue a competitor, Bill Pinckney became the first black American to solo circumnavigate via all five capes aboard a Valiant 40. More hulls of this design have reportedly completed circumnavigations than any other production boat. Displacement runs 22,500 to 24,000 pounds, with 7,700 to 8,400 pounds of external lead ballast on an evolved keel that went through three design iterations. Exactly 200 Valiant 40s left the factory between 1973 and 1992, and the design evolved into the Valiant 42 produced through 2011. Market values spread widely today. Fire retardant Arab boats from 1976 to 1981 sell between $90,000 and $130,000, while Texas-built examples command $160,000 to $280,000. The American Sailboat Hall of Fame inducted the Valiant 40 in 1997 as cruising sailboat of the decade. October 1991 brought the perfect storm, and 75 miles south of Nantucket, a West Sail 32 named Satori found herself caught in monster seas that sank commercial fishing vessels. You might remember this story from the book and movie, where the boat suffered two complete knockdowns, holding her on beam for 30 seconds each before the crew was evacuated. What the movie didn't emphasize was that the boat survived completely unharmed, washing ashore at Assateague, Maryland with zero structural damage. Skipper Ray Leonard retrieved her, paid $10,000 in salvage, and sailed Satori another 6,000 miles while laying a hole three more times in similar conditions. The construction enabling this survival features hull thickness of three quarters inch at top sides, increasing to one and one eighth inches at the turn of bilge, hand laid with 12 alternating layers of mat and woven roving in solid fiberglass without any core materials. A displacement to length ratio of 418 places her among the heaviest 2% of similar sailboats and 7,000 pounds of lead ballast sits encapsulated in the full keel. William I. B. Creolock adapted the hull from William Atkins' Eric design, itself derived from Colin Archer's Norwegian rescue boats that hauled sailors from North Sea Gales. Westsail Corporation in Costa Mesa, California, 
produced 834 hulls between 1971 and 1981, selling about 400 as kits. Original pricing ran $15,000 to $20,000, while current market sits between $30,000 and $60,000. Jerome Rand completed a 271-day solo non-stop circumnavigation aboard Mighty Sparrow in 2017 to 2018, suffering two major Southern Ocean knockdowns where the boat bobbed upright and sailed on each time. Roger and Molly Fiery completed three circumnavigations aboard Sundowner, earning the Seven Seas Award in 2001. Sailors have a saying about the West Sail 32, built like a tank, but unfortunately sails like one too. And that's exactly the point. One more category deserves mention for pushing blue water toughness into new territory, and that's French aluminum expedition yachts from Garcia and Boreal. Legendary circumnavigator Jimmy Cornell approached Garcia yachts to build his ideal expedition boat for the Northwest Passage and the resulting exploration. 45. Aventura 4 became the first of its model, successfully completing that passage in 2015. Ten years later, three more Exploration 45s finished the same route in a single summer. Jean-Pierre and Jean-Louis Garcia founded their shipyard in 1974 in Normandy after finding inspiration in legendary navigators Bernard Moitessier and Joshua Slocum. Marine grade 5083 and 5086 aluminum provides exceptional strength to weight ratio for their builds. Boreal yachts emerged from a different path when founders Jean-Francois Delvoy and Jean-Francois Eamon conceived their design during a six-year family circumnavigation, including extensive time in Patagonia. Their perspective on aluminum is straightforward. Even if it's not mandatory for blue water cruising, its exceptional capacity to deform without breaking gives crews the best chances of staying unharmed during major accidents. The Boreal 47 collected European Yacht of the Year 2021 in the Blue Water Cruiser category and Cruising World Boat of the Year 2018 overall. Jean-Francois Amon took his own children, ages 6 and 8, to Antarctica aboard a Boreal 44. As he put it, that is not a statement, that is a reality. Seven boats, now technically eight with the aluminum expedition category, have earned the built-like-a-tank reputation through documented performance rather than brochure claims. Displacement to length ratios above 300, ballast ratios between 35 and 50 percent, hand-laid solid fiberglass or marine aluminum construction, full or modified keels, and skeg-protected rudders unite them all. But human stories matter more than engineering specs. Jerome Rand endured two knockdowns in Mighty Sparrow and kept sailing. Kurt Bjorklund circled the globe three and a half times aboard Golden Lady. The Contessa, 32. Ascent finished the deadly 1979 Fastnet while 75 boats capsized around her. Ray Leonard sailed Satori, another 6,000 miles after the perfect storm. Jean-Luc Van den Heed won the 2018 Golden Globe race at 73 years old after being pitch-poled in 65-knot winds and 36-foot seas, climbing his mast seven times for repairs while sailing a Rustler 36, essentially a modern Contessa cousin. After his capsize, he observed that he was the only competitor to capsize completely and still have his mast standing. These boats prove that overbuilt isn't an insult, it's an aspiration. When Henri Amel designed four watertight bulkheads into every Super Maramu, when Pacific Seacraft specified vinyl ester resin and 140-degree stability angles, when the Garcia brothers welded icebreaker stems onto aluminum expedition yachts, they weren't building for marketing brochures. They were building for the day everything goes wrong, a thousand miles from rescue, when the only thing between crew and oblivion is the hull beneath their feet. That's what built like a tank really means. If you enjoyed this deep dive into legendary blue water sailboats, hit that subscribe button and join the Nautique crew. We cover the boats, the builders, and the sailors who push the limits of what's possible on the water. Subscribe to Nautique, and we'll see you on the next one.